Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, The Pre-Dental Timeline, presented by the American Student Dental Association. We'd like to thank our generous sponsor, the American Dental Association. In addition to several other ASDA events, the ADA has sponsored Pre-Dental Month for four straight years. The ADA is committed to its members and to the improvement of oral health for the public. Please be sure to, please be sure to visit ADA.org for more information. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. All attendees are muted so that we don't pick up any background noise during the program. The webinar will be recorded and posted on ASDA's website. A link will be emailed to all who have registered for the webinar next week. You'll notice a control panel on the right side of your screen. You can type your question into the screen and it will be added to the queue. A Q&A portion of the webinar will take place at the very end. My name is Brian Jones. I'm ASDA's Membership Development Manager, and I'll be serving as the facilitator for tonight's program. ASDA has a staff of 14 association professionals in our central office located in Chicago. I worked for ASDA for two years, and my main responsibility is creating and managing initiatives to increase pre-dental membership and engagement in ASDA. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about ASDA pre-dental membership. Our panelists this evening are Carson Smith and Hilary Wong. Carson is a senior at the University of Florida, pursuing a dual degree in nutritional sciences and microbiology. He currently serves as a pre-dental consultant to ASDA. His hobbies include all things pre-dental, running, and completing secondaries. Hilary Wong is a junior biochemistry major at Northeastern University. Having caught ASDA fever during her freshman year, she currently serves on the National and District 1 Pre-Dental Advisory Committee hoping to spread ASDA fever to other pre-dental students across the United States. In her free time, Hillary loves exploring new places and trying new activities, eating pho and all other noodle soups, and running along the Charles River. Okay, now I'm gonna turn over the controls to uh, uh, Hillary, our first speaker. Uh, Hillary, you're muted still. Thanks, Brian. Well, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our first webinar of ASDA Pre-Dental Month. Like Brian said, my name is Hillary Wong, and I am a junior pre-dental student at Northeastern University. I have been a pre-dental student for most of my undergrad um, career, and I'm really excited to share with you some of the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. So a quick note about our presentation tonight. What we cover tonight will directly um, relate to the traditional undergraduate student, but in actuality, any pre-dental student can benefit from this information. We do have resources for quote unquote non-traditional pre-dental students to help them navigate through the dental school application process. And as you can see on the right, um, this is the ASDA guide to applying to dental school for non-traditional students that you can definitely look out for. And also in a couple of weeks on October uh, 24th, we will be having another webinar um, to discuss non-traditional career pathways to dental school. So for this presentation, we are going to go over academic preparations of a typical pre-dental student elements of crafting the dental school application and the types of experiences that a pre-dental student should look to be involved in and a general timeline for all pre-dental students to help them organize their pre-dental career. So let's get started. So to begin, we'll go over the academic aspect of the pre-dental journey. Some of you may have your major chosen, but for those of you who don't know what to major in or for those of you who are still deciding um, of switching to a different major, um, something that you should consider when choosing your major is your passions and your strengths. You want to choose your major that will interest you for the duration of your undergrad and a major that can help you provide opportunities for you to develop and grow your interests. Most of these majors will probably be science-based because a lot of dental school um, requirements do require uh, science classes and a lot of these science-based majors in, in part 
incorporate these science classes directly into the major. So it might be easier for you to plan out um, when to take your courses in preparation for dental school. Also, if you do have additional passions or interests, you can always consider using your classes to um, obtain a minor, a dual degree, or other certifications and specializations. I know that some of my pre-dental friends, they um, have certified in emergency medical services, or they've gone and taken um, a dental assisting training program in order to be um, certified in dental assisting. So there's tons of ways for you to stand out. Regar regarding the courses that a pre-dental student should take, in bold, we have here the courses that are required by all dental schools. They are the eight credits of biology with lab, eight credits of general chemistry with lab, eight credits of organic chemistry with lab, eight credits of physics, and eight credits of English. And underneath, um, we have four credits of biochemistry and four credits of microbiology. Those courses, they aren't required. Um, depending on the schools that you're looking at, they may or may not be required. But in general, it's highly recommended that you take those classes. And to the right of the screen, we have coursework that may or may not be required depending on the school that you're looking at. For instance, one of them is math, including calculus, in an English intensive writing course, psychology, sociology, any upper level science classes, humanities, anatomy, and physiology. So a big tip is um, in preparation for dental school is that you look at their website and see what classes each of those schools individually require so that you're able to plan out the course track for the rest of your college career. Something to keep in mind is that most of these dental schools will not accept AP credit or community college credit for their prerequisites, but some of them do. So again, it's highly recommended that you check with the schools themselves to see what their requirements are. And most of these requirements can be listed on their website. And if they aren't listed on their websites, you can definitely email the admissions um, representatives for further clarification. Additionally, some dental schools will not accept grades of a B minus or lower. So that is also something to keep in mind as you're taking these classes. And if there's a school that you're interested in attending, but you don't fulfill the prerequisites for, you can definitely add them to your application in progress. Um, the, the semester before you apply to dental school, you do have to submit your dental application on ADCESS, which is the um, dental school application portal that students use in order to apply. And on that portal, you, there is a slot for you to list the classes that you will be taking in um, a future semester. So as long as you complete all of the required prerequisites before you attend dental school, that should be fine. So this is ASBA's Getting Into Dental School Guide, and all of you will receive this when you sign up for um, ASBA membership. And this year, they're actually coming out with a new version. The photo to the right of your screen um, displays an older version of the book, and I even have this book here. So this book is extremely useful because it gives you all the stats required for all of the dental schools in the United States, including the courses that are required by each school, the average GPA, the number of shadowing hours that the school requires. It also offers additional information such as the combined dual degrees that the school offers, such as um, Master of Public Health or Master of Business Administration. And it also provides the tuition of um, the cost of your education. So in your um, undergraduate career, you will have many classes available to take electives. And it's recommended that you, these electives, um, you take classes that where you can explore your other interests. Because as an undergrad, you might not be 100% certain that dentistry is the path to go. And it's important to like solidify your interest in dentistry or 
um, come to realize that maybe dentistry isn't for you. So you can definitely use these electives to explore other areas that you might be interested in. And some of these electives directly relate to the field of dentistry. Um, every school has a different set of courses, but the examples given here are um, classes are such as um, ceramics, which is an art class and is directly related to dentistry because dentistry is a um, is a field that like really values upon like aesthetics and arts. Um, you can also take communication classes or business classes. And if there's another area that you're super passionate about, you can even use all of those classes to um, obtain a minor. And over here we have some minor listed, but at every school they have a different list of possible minors. But in general, there's usually business-related minors or health-related minors available for you to consider. So, as you are taking all these classes, you also have to keep in mind that at the end of the day, you will need rec letters in order to get into dental school. So it's usually recommended that you do really well in the classes that you want rec letters for. And you don't need to know what, which professor you want a rec letter for um, coming in to the class. And it's just recommended that you stay on top of the class and you engage with the professor. Um, over here at the bottom, we have a logo for Interfolio, and Interfolio is a online website that where you can keep track of the letters that you gain um, over the years. And what Interfolio does is that for the professor that you want a rec letter for, you can send them a link and they will directly upload the rec letter at the end of whatever time you tell them to. And from Interfolio, you can definitely um, upload the rec letters to AdSess. And it is a great um, software to help you keep track of the rec letters that you get over the years because um, at a large school, professors have so many rec letters to write um, in one year and they might not have time to write you one or you, they're reminded reminded of writing other people one, but they might forget to write you one. So you can start collecting rec letters from the beginning of your college education. Um, one thing to keep in mind though, a letter from freshman year might not be the best representation of you at the time that you're going to apply. So it's definitely good to keep, keep connections with those professors over the years and keep them updated on what you're up to as you grow and develop your passion for dentistry. So you might be wondering, is there an exam that you need to take in order to get into dental school? And unfortunately, there is. And it's called the DAT, or the Dental Admission Test. This is a test that um, is supposed to assess your potential for success in dental school. And it is a five-hour exam, multiple choice based, that covers the topics of biology, general chemistry, organic chemistry, perceptual ability, reading, and math. You might be wondering, when is the best time to take the DAT? And it's different for everyone, but in general, you would want to take the DAT as soon as you finish your prerequisite classes, such as biology, general chemistry, and organic chemistry. I know people who have taken um, the DAT right after sophomore year, when they have all this information fresh in their minds. But if that doesn't work for you, you can also take it um, at a some like during a time when you know you have a lot of time to devote to studying. Um, I know people who have studied over the summer during winter breaks. You just have to make sure that you're you have enough time to fully prepare for this exam. And you also would it's also recommended that you give yourself time um, to retake the exam if it happens. And you also want to make sure that you take it when you feel most comfortable. So a lot of people, they, um, they sign up for the exam, but when it comes closer to the exam date, they realize that they haven't studied as much as they want to. So in that situation, it is possible to push out the deadline for your exam in order to ensure that you get the highest grade um, or score that you can. 
And for me personally, I haven't taken the DAT yet. And the reason being um, is that the DAT score is only valid for two years or three years, depending on which schools that you're looking at. And at the time that I wanted to take the DAT, um, my score, I realized that my score wouldn't be valid by the time that I applied for dental school. So I'm holding off on taking the DAT until um, sometime in the near future. And to learn more about test taking strategies for this exam and what this exam is in general, you can join us for another webinar on October 10th, um, where we will be featuring different DAT resources that you can utilize. So now we're going to get into different elements of the application process. Well, hello, my name is Carson Smith and I am currently a senior at the University of Florida um, pursuing my dual degree in nutrition and microbiology. <clears throat> I think I'm going to have to take away the webcam because I'm struggling to get these slides back up with it. One second, sorry. So I do apologize for that delay, but it looks like I've just got the slides back. So I'll be talking about crafting the perfect application. And really, um, a lot of the material we'll be covering, covering tonight will play into that application so that we can fulfill all the spots and subsections of it. Um, so with that being said, we're going to start with letters of evaluation like Hillary touched on earlier. So generally accepted, what you're going to be aiming for in terms of letters of recommendation are going to be two science professors, one non-science professor, and one dentist. These four letters will cover the majority of the requirements set out um, by dental schools. However, some different dental schools have their own special request um, based on their philosophies, and so that may include a religious leader, um, that may include a third science professor, or maybe a volunteer coordinator. In that case, um, ADSAS only allows you to upload four letters to the application portal. So if you have run out of spaces, many times those schools are accommodating and allow you to um, send a letter externally via mail. And so one thing that I found really helpful as I'm currently in the application cycle is creating a letter writer's packet. And this packet just, um, the cover photo has a picture of myself and my name, and then the next page might have a letter um, to my letter writer asking them to um, write my letter if I haven't already previously spoke to them about it, thanking them uh, for being willing to write me a letter, um, sharing some of my passions, and then followed, following that letter, I'll have my CV in there and my personal statement. And in reality, I don't think many of my letter writers uh, read this packet, but what I do think it showed was that I have an invested interest in this and it showed my commitment to my writer. And so I can say myself, um, when I went in and asked uh, my letters to be written quickly and turned in promptly, it was done so. And I think that's part um, due to the fact that I did write those packets. Another part, important part of the application is the personal statement. So this personal statement is 4,500 characters um, explaining why you want to pursue a career in dentistry. The prompt itself is explaining why you want to pursue a dental career. And so you have these 4,500 characters to tell a story or maybe explain your motives, um, all while making sure you stand out. 
it's really never too early to start on a personal statement. I know I've gone through a couple different um, versions and I've continued to update it throughout the years. And I think that really allows you to de um, dig deep and think critically about why you want to pursue a career in dentistry and uh, really allows you to create the best product. So with that being said, we're going to start talking about experiences, which are a portion of the application that you'll update. So the dental school application has different experiences sub subsections. They include volunteering, dental shadowing, academic enrichment, extracurriculars, employment, research, and fine motor skills. Each one of these sections may allow you to add five to ten experiences for each subsection, with fine motor skills allowing you to add a paragraph. Um, so rather than explaining maybe five different fine motor skills you've utilized, you'll simply have a paragraph text box um, to explain your fine motor skills. With that being said, these numbers change year to year. So really, if you're looking back at previous years, to determine how many, how many slots you might have for dental shadowing, that might change. So this is a really amazing list that I found on, um, and it's basically pre-professional core competencies as suggested by the Association of American Medical Colleges. These are soft skills that really you can't learn in a classroom, and so it's an excellent way to showcase your strengths through your extracurriculars and experiences. These are all uh, skills and attributes that every great medical or dental professional has. And so while you're looking for experiences, you might want to make sure that they fall under some sort of one of these competencies that you can then showcase later on through your application and interview. Something like service-oriented and teamwork, resilience and adaptability, critical thinking all play into the dental career field. And so showing them through your experiences show why you might be perfect fit, why you might be a perfect fit. So first off, we're going to start out with volunteering. And I'll preface this by saying that a lot of your experiences can fall under more than one category. And so you might struggle to decide, well, am I going to list this as volunteering, or am I going to list this as extracurricular, or am I going to list this as dental shadowing? It's important when you fill out the application that you, you simply uh, share the wealth of your activities so that you have no blank spaces and so really a lot of things can fall under multiple subsections. With that being said, with volunteering you want to find a cause outside of dentistry. Not something that you're doing just for a resume line but something that you actually care about. So that shows through in your application. Something that's important to consider is really quality matters over quantity. So when you're, when you're um, fulfilling these volunteer hours that you need for your application, um, consider finding one cause and devoting a lot of time to it versus hopping around from different project to different project. Some examples that uh, we've discussed are maybe mentoring at-risk youth. I know dance marathons really big at some schools, so dance marathon would definitely count as volunteering or organizing a clothing drive for the homeless. So, oh my gosh, it did it again. I apologize. So dental shadowing, another important part of the application. So you want to make sure that with your shadowing hours, you have a variety of experiences, whether that's in different practice models or specialties, maybe different setups of practices, so Medicaid versus fee-for-service. And so uh, exploring all these different opportunities will really give you a breadth of knowledge regarding the dental field and allow you to go into interviews to share your experiences. I know personally, I've um, attended a few interviews where they've been really surprised that I as shadowing at a public health clinic, and they want to know all about that because that's something rare that not a lot of applicants come in with. It's important that during this time you understand basic procedures. I know it's not a crazy interview question to be asked. Explain to me how you would do a root canal using all the proper terminology and outlining every step to the procedure. 
Another helpful tip is to document all your hours and experiences in a journal, keeping in mind that there are uh, HIPAA guidelines regarding patient privacy. This journal can be great to not only keep track of these hours that you're going to need to recall for your application, but also give you experiences that you can reflect on as you go into crafting a personal statement or interviews. You're going to want to shoot for at least 100 hours, but many have hundreds more, and so you definitely need requirements of schools that you're interested in. Some schools will have a requirement of 100 hours, some schools won't have a requirement at all, but with that being said, I know many pre-dentals who maybe have 1,000 hours, and so it's just a that you show consistency over time. I know a popular question is, well, my mom or dad is a dentist, could I shadow them? And while it's perfectly fine to shadow them, I wouldn't count these in dental shadowing hours um, because it can be looked down upon by some admissions committees to spend the majority of your time shadowing your family members. With that being said, ASA has prepared a pre-dental how-to shadowing guide, and I would definitely check it out on the website. In the shadowing guide, we have um, the perfect sample email to help you arrange the opportunity with the dentist, as well as steps to prepare. Um, for the shadowing experience as well as how to act during and following the experience. Extracurriculars. So these are kind of um, the social aspects maybe more so in different passions outside of volunteering and dental shadowing that are going to accompany your application. So it's important that you showcase your abilities and passions, passions through these. Make sure your experiences are meaningful and that you can grow from them. Be able to verbalize them as you go into interviews to share what you've gained and learned from these experiences. I know one extracurricular that I've gotten involved with at the University of Florida are the different pre-dental clubs, and I think that's really helped me as an applicant and as a great social uh, community. And so if you don't have a pre-dental club at your university, if you're large enough, I want to consider starting one. Employment. So employment's going to cover everything from a part-time job to internships and work study. If you have employment, it's ideal, um, hopefully, ideally, you would have a job that is some sort of related to dentistry. However, it's not a requirement, and it's definitely not looked down upon to have a job that's not related to dentistry. Uh, so that might be working at the front desk of a dental office, it might be sterilizing instruments, or it might be something completely different. So with that being said, any job can help you become a well-rounded applicant. You want to focus on the soft skills that translate well to dentistry that you learn from that job. And so I know personally one of my first jobs was working in a pharmacy, and I've had questions in um, dental interviews, why aren't you interested in pursuing a career in pharmacy? So it's important that if you have a job in other healthcare settings that offer strengths, you be able to explain why you are not fit to pursue a job as a certified nursing assistant and moving on to a nurse or a physician. Research is another subsection of the application. While any exposure to research is encouraged, it's definitely not a requirement. However, there are some definite valuable skills that are associated with research, and that includes, I mean, critical thinking, analysis, teamwork, reading, ability to communicate, and so uh, when it comes time to interview, it's definitely important to consider if you have research or if you don't, the different schools' missions that you're applying to. A lot of schools will have uh, missions of research. Part of their mission statement will include research. And so it's important that if you are going to a school that values research, you either know your research forwards or, and backwards, or, or you know why you chose not to pursue research. Fine motor skills. So like I shared, this is a paragraph text box that you will fill out explaining what activities you have done regarding fine motor skills. It's important that you focus on maybe unconventional fine motor talents, um, as oftentimes some motor, fine motor activities are overused or common to applicants or just common in general. I know I was speaking to somebody who sits on an admissions committee about her feelings on different fine motor skills, and she shared with me, you know, every female is going to do their makeup. And so it's important when you're filling out an application to remember that applicant pool does their makeup, and so that's not necessarily a fine motor skill that will stick out and get admissions committee's attention. 
Also, it's important you do not lie. I've heard stories of people saying, I play guitar, and then you walk into your interview, and they just happen to have a guitar there. So uh, maybe some activities that you participated in that would require fine motor skills would include research or potentially where you work at. Some examples of different fine motor skills I've heard people apply with include fishing, jewelry making, photography, and henna tattoo art. With that being said, I'm going to pass this back to Hillary, who's going to be sharing with us the pre-dental timeline. Thanks, Carson. All right, so our first pre-dental timeline is... Sorry for the delay, guys. All right, so as I mentioned, the first prudential timeline is what is leading up to the application. So what are some things that you should do leading up to the application? So first and foremost, you should always explore your interests through classes, through different activities. As you go through your undergrad, you are going to change as a person semester to semester, year to year. Your interests are going to change depending on what you do and sometimes you might join a club or an activity and realize you like it a lot more than something else that you thought you would like a lot. So always be flexible with your interests and your passions. And it's also highly recommended that as soon as you have an inkling that you might be interested in the dental field, that you join your university's pre-dental club and sign up for ASDA. As Carson mentioned previously, um, his pre-dental club like, helped him enormously enormously through the application process and my of other students should Oh, sorry. My webcam is so. So, prepare school application process. It offers resources that can guide you through the shadowing process, through letters of rec, things that you should be looking out for. I know personally, I love as this um, publications such as the Mouthing Off blog and the Contour because these these um insightful to hear from other people's perspectives and sometimes you yourself will grow from learning about what other people are doing. Another big thing is to keep your grades up. You might think that uh, as a fresh that is important, but they don't have a rigorous education curriculum. So you want to make sure that you're staying on top of your classes and working hard and pushing through all those challenges and assignments because you want to show dental schools that you're ready for the next level of rigorous um, classes. Many universities also have pre-health info sessions over the years. And I know that at my school, they have um, every year for freshmen, sophomore, juniors, they have an info session specifically targeted to students of that year, um, telling people 
telling those students like what they need to focus on for that year. So freshman year, um, the info session covered basics of what is the pre-health field, like what are things you should be looking at, such as volunteering, such as your grades. And then sophomore year, it was more of a check-in, like you should continue to invest in those activities that you're passionate about, and you should continue to look for ways to strengthen your applica application process. And for juniors who are um, planning on applying that year, the pre-health info session really covers the logistics, like when should you ask for rec letters, when should you complete your personal statement. So your pre-health department should be able to work closely with you and help you and support you along your, um, during your application process so that you're prepared um, to apply. Another um, thing to consider as you go through your undergrad is, as, as mentioned previously, um, consider rec letter options. It's important to keep your professors um, that you might consider asking for a rec letter open and to do well in the classes that you're considering asking for a rec letter because professors often have more to say about you if you are a good student, if you're actively engaged and definitely get to know your professors um, during office hours or outside of class so that they can write a strong rec letter that really reflects your personality, your work ethic, and your attitude towards academics and dentistry. Besides all of that, as you're moving up in your college career, you should always um, be in self-reflection. You should always ask yourself, why do you want to do dentistry? Can you see yourself being happy in this field for the rest of your life? Sometimes um, for new pre-dental students, they might be switching between pre-dental, pre-med, or other pre-health paths, and they don't really know why they want to do dentistry, and that's okay. The more that you engage in the different extracurriculars that you're interested in, the more you'll know about yourself and the more you'll know whether the dental field um, is for you. And as always, figure out a good time to study and take the DAT. Um, in this slide, it's recommended that you take it either like the summer before you apply or right after you take all your basic classes. Everybody is different, um, so you work out. You so you'll know when to work out a schedule for yourself. And lastly, before you actually apply for the dental application, think about post graduation plans. Do you want to take a gap year? Do you want to um, enroll in a post back program and a master's program? Do you want to take a couple of years off and work? There is no traditional pre dental path to get into dental school, every pre-dental applicant is different and unique in their own way. And you might feel pressured to go straight into dental school right after undergrad just because you know a lot of people um, are following that specific pathway. But if you feel that that's not for you, then that's okay. The most important thing is that you take the time to develop yourself and to truly develop your passion in dentistry because you don't want to start applying for dental school and regret that it might not be the field that you want to work in for the rest of your life. So in terms of gap year options, these are this slide gives you a general idea of activities you can do during your gap year if you choose to decide a gap year. And actually, in recent years, gap years are becoming a lot more um, popular. And it's often, I think dental schools now are more encouraging students to take a gap year and to truly like develop themselves more and to gain like a more mature perspective on the dental field. So during your gap year, you can volunteer, and if your GPA is low, you can continue, continue to take um, other classes or retake classes or move on to a post back that might strengthen your GPA. You can work on your personal statement and really hone out your motives for going into dentistry. You can work. Um, and if your DAT is low and you need that extra time to study, you can also do that during your gap year. 
And of course, you can also shadow and look for more um, dental related experiences. It's often recommended that during your gap year, you do um, something that is related to dentistry because um, dental schools want to see that if you're really interested in dentistry, you keep up with your passion. And by doing something related to dentistry, it further strengthens um, your application and tells dental school that you're serious about making this commitment to this field. And in terms of application logistics, so usually the spring before you apply, you should definitely get your letters of evaluation ready and start working on your personal statement. And June 1st is usually the first date that the um, application portal opens. And it's highly, highly, highly recommended that applicants submit their applications as early as possible. Um, I believe that the, in terms of securing interviews, dental schools look through their applications on a rolling basis. So the sooner you submit your application, the sooner they'll look at it. And because, because they look at earlier applications first, they won't have that many applica applications to like compare to. So they might think more favorably of you versus someone who like submitted in the last possible um, time slot. Um, and during the summer and fall, you'll receive secondary applications from the dental schools inviting you to write additional essays for them to get to know you better. So the interview process usually starts uh, during the fall and, all, and goes all the way to the spring. And December to the first day of classes is when you get accepted into dental school. And summer or fall, you start dental school, and that's it. So that was our presentation, and now we'll move on to Q&A. So feel free to send any of your questions you may have over the chat box to us, and we'll be answering them in order. If we fail to see or if we fail to get to your question, you can always email us after the webinar. So the first one we're going to answer is does the DAT score date expire? And so I don't know if there's definitely a, a expiration date set out by the ADA or any sort of body like that, but there's definitely schools that will only accept a score within two years of you taking it or maybe three years of taking it, and so that's something you need to verify with each individual school. The second question is how many times can you take the DAT? So in theory, you can take the DAT as many times as you want. It's recommended that you take it once. Um, and if you need to, twice. And it's also important to note that you can only retake the DAT 90 days after you complete the test. So they do make you wait for, a, for three months before you can sign up for it again. And I will say with the DAT, um, the ADA, the American Dental Association, which uh, writes the test, only allows you to take the test three times total without uh, petitioning for an extra retake. And so it's important that you get a score that you're happy with, hopefully on your first time, but if it takes additional tries and then you even have to go beyond three, you're going to have to be looking into petitioning for whatever reason you may need. So I'm a freshman in college. When is a good time to join ASDA? Um, I'm partial to this. I think right now is the perfect time to join ASDA. We have a great uh, opportunity available, which your membership, if you sign up today, will go through uh, December 2018. And so our membership runs from January to December. And so if you sign up today or for the rest of 2017, your membership will be effective for those extra months. And you can start receiving all the benefits that come with that. 
uh, there's a ton of benefits, and so being a freshman allows you to explore those benefits longer than, uh, and really give you an opportunity to experience all the benefits. The next question is, how old are letters of recommendation considered too old? So the thing about rec letters of rec is that they should reflect you as an individual, as a student, at the time that you're applying. So it's okay to get a letter um, from your freshman year teacher, but you also want to make sure that they're not only talking about you when you were a freshman, that they also include how you've grown as an individual till when you apply. Also, to tag on to this, I think if you pursue maybe a post-bac uh, post or a master's, it's probably best that you update those letters of recommendation with people that you took that, that coursework with, um, because they're going to know you best in terms of your capabilities um, and speak to the coursework that you recently completed. So the next question, for the application cover sheet, how did you evaluate which items you want to select and highlight for experiences? So uh, this is something that we didn't really cover, but the application allows you to go through for each subsection and star different things uh, that go on to a cover sheet. This cover sheet is the first page of your application that admissions officers will read. And so it kind of gives them a glance. It might say like your DAT, your GPA, and then your top three awards, your top three shadowing experiences, so they can get a quick glimpse about you and decide if they would like to read further. Um, I know personally, going through the application cycle, I selected the items that I thought uh, first were diverse, but then also spoke to, I guess, my greatest accomplishments. Uh, with my shadowing, I had experiences in a private practice. I had experiences shadowing student dentists here at the University of Florida, and uh, and then hours at a public health clinic. And so I was, I thought it was important to show all of those um, because they are diverse. Next question. If the GPA is low but DAT is good and all other extracurricular activities are good, do you think the person might have a chance? So I know from the dental students that I've talked to, um, so the GPA is really an important factor in your application. Dental schools, like you can't make up for the GPA by being good in activities and stuff because dental school, you will have to take really hard classes and at probably more than twice the rate of your undergraduate college. So the dental, committee, they really want to make sure that you are a strong enough student to survive that program, which is why they emphasize having a good GPA. That being said, um, I would recommend looking at the minimum GPA requirement of the schools that you're considering and talking with the admissions people there to confirm how they look upon um, whatever GPA that person might have. I think it's also worth noting within um, your guide to dental school that you would receive from ASDA, all the admissions averages are in there. So it's important to understand when you're looking at an average that about 50% of the people are going to have a lower GPA or DAT. And so it's really, there's no perfect answer to that. Um, so you just have to give it a try. You might have to be more strategic with where you're applying and apply more widely. Is there an advantage to having an ASDA chapter versus just a pre-dental club? So this is definitely an, a, a huge topic that probably could have its own webinar, but basically um, pre-dental clubs have the ability to become an ASDA chapter. There's a ton of great benefits associated with that. You know, being able to say your club is part of the largest national student dental organization with 93% of dental students in it. There's name recognition when you go to interviews, every dean's going to know what ASDA is. In terms of the support that ASDA can provide you, there's just so much. So I definitely encourage you to check out the ASDA website at asdanet.org, and that'll better explain the benefits to being a pre-dental chapter. 
in an interview, do you recommend mentioning that you want to specialize? So you're going into dental school to ultimately become a general dentist. That is what you're guaranteed when you apply to dental school. You're not guaranteed to specialize. So if you show up to an interview saying you want to specialize, the dental people interviewing like for that purpose and not for like the possibility of becoming a general dentist so I wouldn't word it um, as you want to specialize but I would word it as you're interested in considering other specialties and if you have shadowed at other specialties you can definitely use that as a talking point during your interview I think also that's probably something more school specific too, based on where you're interviewing. I know that there's some schools that appreciate when a student comes in and wants to specialize just because maybe they're, they're strong. And that fact, uh, there's certain schools that have 80% of their students specialize. And so maybe it wouldn't be as frowned upon to go to that school and say, yes, I'm interested in specializing. But then there's other schools whose mission statements are just to create a general dentist. And so it, it would be frowned upon most likely to to say you want to specialize there. So do you attend schools within your home state? Is it easier? I attend the University of Florida. I'm from Orlando, Florida. I'm not sure if what we're talking about easier. I guess it's easier on me being um, so close to home. I'm two hours from home, but uh, there are benefits for me being here, there's a dental school year, so I have access to different resources that maybe other people don't. Yeah, like what Carson said, um, I'm from um, I, I'm from Massachusetts, and I also go to school in Massachusetts. And in Boston, there's like three dental schools, so there's always like pre-dental conferences going on. So it's a lot. To work. Okay, the next question is, so the next question is, how do admissions committees view a second time applicant? Is it common to get in after applying for a second time? So there's really a couple things that play into this uh, question. I will say I've heard from people that, you know, applying two or three times shows that you're really invested in the uh, career, that you didn't just get turned away and decide, you know what, this isn't for me. So it is a benefit in that fact, but then also you need to know that if you're reapplying, there uh, needs to be improvement in your application. So when you go in uh, to interviews, you can share with what you've been doing with your free time to improve as an applicant. But then also there is actually a question on the application if you've reapplied, uh, what have you done to improve? So what are the benefits of joining ASDA? So there's really so many different benefits. Um, I mean, I can, I can share a few with them with you, but it's going to be best that you check out the website uh, for uh, the most of the benefits to be listed. So there's definitely financial benefits. Uh, we have discounts with three major DAT resource providers, so you can get prepared for the um, different things like these webinars. So tonight's webinar was available to anybody who would like to watch it. We have webinars later on in the month that are definitely important to view, but those are going to be uh, strictly for our members. In addition, you have the ability to attend some of our, uh, attend the national events. There's just so many opportunities for you to build a well-rounded application and resume. Uh, so just check out those benefits on the website. How do you go about seeking a letter of recommendation if it's been a while since you've seen the professor? Um, so this is something that I struggled with. To be honest, I didn't have any letters of recommendation prior to last spring. And so I went into the application cycle. Don't do that. Uh, I went into the application cycle with, I mean, ideas of who I was going to ask. But uh, basically, I would probably ask, I would send the Write or send the professor an email explaining what you've been up to, uh, reintroducing yourself if it's been that long, and 
just asking them, I, I mean, I was flat out blunt with a couple of my emails because I was like getting down to the wire. So some people feel like maybe you should ask to go meet with the professor, but for me personally, I had to ask, will you write me a letter of recommendation? If not, like I'm moving on. So uh, <laughs> definitely something to think about if you're seeking a letter of recommendation to keep up those contacts. I personally didn't use Interfolio, but I think that would have helped me. Um, I mean, my letters worked out fine, but it probably would have been easier on me if I got started on that earlier. I hope my connection is okay right now, but how many dental schools should I apply to? Is there a limit? Typically, people apply to between 10 and 15 dental schools, I would say. You, ha you do have to remember that dental school, like every application I think is like $100, right, Carson? Yeah, so it does so, get expensive really fast. Well, and with that being said, uh, the, the average person is applying to like 9 to 10 dental schools, but uh, there is no limit. With that being said, though, every application, your first school that you select is like $250, each additional school is $100, and then if that school wants to send you a secondary application, there might be a fee associated with that. So that fee could run anywhere from $30 to $150, and then maybe they invite you to an interview, so you're going to need a plane flight out there, and so that's going to be $300, you're going to need to book a hotel, so it gets expensive really quickly. And so um, I would be strategic with where you're applying um, and consider the cost factor, but then also, uh, you know, if maybe if it's the one more school that would accept you, then you need to weigh those costs and benefits. I am a pre-dental student and would like to major in chemistry. How good would it be to have a minor in business? Honestly, I think that's an... I personally think, I, I personally wish I had the course space to like minor in something else that wasn't like science related. Because I also think that like as a science major, you take so many classes that are science-based, science-based, and science-based, and you sometimes like lose sight of what other fields there are. And especially because dentistry is really interdisciplinary, it's really helpful to be able to communicate with people who might not have the same like technical background as you, but have the same like common knowledge as you in another area. Um. <clears throat> So I'm sorry if we skip over your question, cause, questions because there are some really personal ones that just wouldn't um, be best to answer in this setting. But this one's about um, I'm located in an area that we don't have any post -back programs near me. So just because there are no post -back programs, you can definitely enroll in a different institution and take uh, more coursework. And so it won't be associated with the post -back, but that's something to consider uh, to continue building your application. So what classes do you consider most important when applying to dental school? Like, which one should you absolutely get an A out of? So I think you should absolutely get an A out of every single one. <laughs> but um, I will say that I feel, I mean, I'm gonna, I can be completely honest. I have a C in organic chemistry too. Um, that hasn't really come up in interviews. I don't think it's really affected me getting interviews. And so, uh, you definitely want to have great grade trends. Definitely, if it's going to be those prerequisites, knock those out of the park, but don't sweat it if you have a couple blemishes on your transcript. And I will have to say that dental schools, they mostly prioritize the science classes because I think they do recalculate your science GPA, which includes like all science classes and math classes. So whatever you take, like make sure that you do well in those classes the science ones and the math ones. So actually on the ADSAS application, there's gonna be about 40 different GPAs that are calculated. And so that'll include like your biology degree, your biology classes with plus or minuses, your biology classes without plus or minus grades, your chemistries, and really just so many GPAs that you didn't even know could exist. Uh, so to follow that up, how are, the, I'll take this one since it's more application related, how are evaluation and recommendation letters uploaded to your application? So there's two ways to go about this. Uh, I personally did the first method, which is just on your application, you designate who you want to write your letters of recommendation. Those people uh, 
are then sent a link. They write their letters of recommendation and upload it through that link and it's uploaded to your application. The second option we were talking about in Interfolio, which allows you to do those letters prior to the application. Um, and Interfolio sends those over. And so you just uh, you connect the two accounts up by saying, I have an Interfolio account. Is it okay to take five years in undergrad rather than four, or does that seem like a bad sign? So I am actually from a five-year undergrad program, and I don't think it's a bad sign. Um, I'm not sure what your program is like, but my program, they, they incorporate like six-month internships into our undergrad, and having that work experience like behind you can help strengthen your application and help you develop a more mature perspective as you're going out into the professional world. So I don't think it really matters whether your undergrad is four years or five years or even three years. What matters is how you spend that time, what you invest in, and how you grow as a dental applicant. I think following that up too, um, you know, there, if your plans change, if, um, so maybe it takes you a little bit longer because your plans change, there's definitely ways to note that in your application. And so you don't need to feel like, oh, uh, admissions, people are going to read into too much about why it took five years. You can explain that your degree took five years or maybe you wanted to spend time exploring this and so you took extra coursework here and so that's why it took you longer. So would I have an advantage if I have a dual, to, dual major? Um, I'm personally a dual major, so I'm kind of slighted to this. I do believe, I mean, I have, I wouldn't say it's like an amazing advantage, but when I go into interviews and say, you know, like I, I took extra upper science level courses that weren't required. I think it's appreciated and I think it's looked positively on, especially in my situation, I don't have a phenomenal science GPA. And so I figured if I add on a second science major, then I will have more coursework that I can then support the idea that I can successfully complete the coursework. I heard that psychology slash psychobiology classes are calculated separate from biology. Is that true? So I actually don't know the answer to this question. Carson, do you have a, any idea? Yeah, so there's, there's all sorts. When you add your grade, when you add your classes to the ADSAF application, you designate what, um, what I guess closely resembles the course. They have all sorts of uh, types that you choose from. So like maybe your, um, like I'm in, I'm a nutrition major. I have a nutrition major. And so a lot of my classes are classified as like biological science, I guess. And so it's how you classify those classes on ADSAS. So it's probably just a formality that your psychobiology is not considered biology, but more psychology. So how would you start shadowing a student dentist? At the University of Florida, it's a program that we have. And so uh, your school, if you're associated with a dental school, may or may not have it. It's just up to the school. Um, so I would just do a quick Google search, maybe reach out to somebody at the school to see if it's possible. Yeah, and I know that from my personal experiences, I had to call like over 20 dental offices just to hear back from like one dentist. So getting these, um, Shadowing experiences without that personal connection might be difficult, but it is doable. And don't be discouraged if the first dentist that you reach out to doesn't reply to you. So um, I'm a freshman. Should I take time to get letters of recommendation now or focus on building, maintaining relationships with my professors and ask later? I think the second is your better option, building and maintaining relationships and then asking later but you also don't want to be in a situation where they don't remember you. And so it's checking in with them frequently and letting them know what you're up to that um, has its own benefits of maybe they'll know you for two or three years versus four to five months. And so they'll have more to write about. If you want to start dental school in the fall of 2019, when do you recommend taking the DAT and applying to the various dental schools? So if personally, you would start, I would, oh. Oh, yeah. personally, I would take the DAT 
when I have the time. So this is a personal question. Um, you have to figure out when you have like a block of three months to study for the DAT or when you have time to study for the DAT if, if you don't have that three month block. So with uh, fall 2019, you would be applying in the summer of 2018. So next summer you would apply. Um, I took my DAT a year early. I took it the summer in between my sophomore and junior year and then I'm applying between my junior and senior year. Um, I highly recommend that because it gave me time for retakes if I needed it, but it also allowed me to focus solely on the application when it came June 1st. I didn't have to worry about the DAT. My DAT was done. My DAT was going to be uploaded. I had to worry about personal, uh, my letters of evaluation. So I was out there freaking about that, but I didn't have to balance both. So that's a nice plus, but then I've also heard from people who've taken it like right when they've applied that you then have biochemistry maybe. And so biochemistry is a tough course. You're going to spend more time learning about study habits and what works best for you. So maybe you'll come out with uh, some better knowing what works for you versus what I did. How much in advance should you sign up to take the DAT? So uh, to, do, to sign up for the DAT, you do it through the ADA. So you have to make a account and then you register, you apply to take the DAT. Um, by applying to take the DAT, everybody is approved. It's not like they're going to be like, no, you can't take the DAT. So once you apply, then uh, you're sent a link through the testing center who then allows you to schedule your test. And so it's kind of a process, but it's not something that needs to be done over six months. So I think I, because I wanted a date set, I knew um, I wanted to take my DAT in three months. I scheduled it within a week and had a date out in three months. So that's up to you. I really want to get some experience in dental public health. Do you have any ideas for volunteering opportunities in this area? I personally am really interested in dental public health, so I went through that same um, struggle. And what I did was I Google searched like dental health related like projects in the area, and I end up um, volunteering for this homeless shelter near my college. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I would also recommend if there's like a dental school nearby, you can even like get in touch with them and see if they are working on any dental, um, public dental, public health dentistry like outreach programs. So that's another um, way to get plugged in. Um, I know for me personally, some of the experiences I've had with public health dentistry have come from the fact that I'm at the University of Florida, so we have a dental school here. Um, but then also, don't be afraid to go out and search your own things, Mission of Mercy, your RAM clinics. Uh, if you don't know what those are and you're interested in public health, uh, Google Mission of Mercy or RAM clinics. And basically, these are free clinics that are put on in gymnasiums across, this, uh, across the nation that provide free dental care to anybody who shows up. So something like that, and that's hosted through maybe your local dental um, organization or your state dental organization going there and assisting. I know personally I created a service project uh, for patients and residents of nursing and retirement facilities and so public health includes education and so I spent some time educating people so that's a way to get that experience. So uh, regarding recommendations with science faculty, do they need to be strictly biology, chemistry, et cetera, or social science would fall into the category of science faculty? So I would not try a social science professor, um, but with that being said, your biology, chemistry, it really depends on your schools. So some schools say we only want biology, chemistry, or organic chemistry. Anything beyond that we don't want. Some schools will give you some wiggle room. So like I have a nutrition professor who wrote me a science letter when nutrition's not a core science. Um, I would be careful with the social science though because that's not, a, I mean, strictly a science. But that would be the perfect for a non-science letter. And I think some schools would enjoy that. Do a lot of anatomy classes look good? 
I don't know what you mean by a lot, but I do know that anatomy, having that background would help you a lot in dental school because dental school, they speed through all parts of the body like really fast. So just ha having learned something previously, it'll be e easier for you to like recall it during your dental education. Also, there are some schools that are going to require that anatomy course, but I would say if you're applying to dental school, no school is going to look at an anatomy class and say why they take that. So it's definitely one of those great, uh, an upper level science course that would look great on your application. And so I think going into the application, you definitely don't want to have the mentality of just like checking boxes. Um, I need this done, I need this done. Like, feel free to take those upper level science courses, even if they aren't necessarily required, because I think they'll be looked positively on later on. Would biopsychology count as a science letter recommendation? I'm not 100% sure. I've never taken a biopsychology class, so I, I would, I mean, if you ever have a question about something like a, a detail like that, you could definitely feel free to contact admissions offices and say, hey, I'm taking a biopsychology class. Would you guys count it as a letter of recommendation? But keep in mind that you want to make sure that you are marketable to the wide variety of dental schools. And so I would reach out to maybe a couple of dental schools to see their feelings on that. Or you could also have a backup letter uh, to your biopsychology. So maybe you have your biopsychology letter, but if a school doesn't allow that, you have an extra chemistry one that maybe is not as strong as your biopsychology, but you could send it if need be. So what is a competitive DAT score? Um, so we're actually going to be reviewing the DAT in a week, and really the DAT scoring system is kind of hard to explain. Um, but the average general school matriculate has between a 19 and a 20, and so you definitely want to be shooting around there. Um, the higher, the better. So it's, it's, once again, dependent on the schools that you're applying to, really. So somebody asked again about the letters of recommendation and submitting them. There's two ways to submit them, once again. You can submit them directly to AdSAS right when the application opens by inputting your writer's emails and contact information. Or you can use Interfolio, and Interfolio allows you to uh, curate letters prior to the application opening. So you could have it two years out. You could have these letters of recommendations that are started, and then those uh, you just link the two accounts, and those letters are uploaded directly from Interfolio. There's also... Um this thing called the committee letter, which is basically um, a accumulation of all the letters that you've gotten from your science professors and the pre-health, the pre-health department usually like paraphrases like different parts of those letters into one big letter of recommendation. And the committee letter um, is looked favorably upon by dental schools because um, it shows that you have the support of your pre-health department um, when you're applying. And so that's going to be a school specific thing. I know here at the University of Florida we don't do pre-health <coughs> letters and so I had to go out and get my letters individually so you definitely want to check with your pre-health department to see if they offer that. Sometimes maybe an interview will be involved with it so you'll go before a committee and share with them why you want to be a dentist so that they can speak to that in your, uh, in your letter. Or they might request your personal statement or so what is the highest DAT score you can get? So theoretically, you could get a 30 um, in certain sections of the DAT. However, your highest score is not going to be, uh, like your academic average or total science average won't be a 30. The test is scaled on a 1 to 30 uh, numerical scale. And so you'll get somewhere in there. I would say, I mean, like a 26, 27 are the highest scores that I've heard of. So can you speak about writing a personal statement? Um, so really the personal statement is open-ended. You can write about whatever you would like. I've heard of people writing about running. I've heard about people, I mean, 
writing about their experiences in the dental office as a child and how that led them to pursuing dentistry. Mine personally, um, last spring I didn't really have anything that I thought would make a good story. And so I was shadowing at a uh, Mission of Mercy clinic like we were talking about earlier. And I ended up having an experience that I shared in my opening paragraph. So basically I have like an anecdote of uh, treatment with a patient. And then I talk about maybe the social effects of that treatment on her. And then I talk about some of my experiences throughout college that pr has prepared me for dental school. So it's 4,500 characters, and it's really about whatever you'd like to talk about. If your university, if our, yeah, you got this. Okay. If our university does committee letters, should we still attain additional letters? I don't think you need any additional letters, like in terms of like professors, um, because again, that committee letter is basically a huge summary of all this individual letters from the professors that you ask. But you will need a letter of rec from a dentist, so that's something to keep in mind. So your committee letter counts as three letters on the application and you have four slots. So meaning if you do a committee letter that's going to count as three of your letters and you're going to still have one slot that you should probably fill up with a dentist. Um, however, like we were talking about, there's different schools that require maybe a religious leader, volunteer coordinator, humanities professor, so that may need to fit in there or be sent externally. Have you attended the National Leadership Conference? Hillary, did you attend last year? I did not, but I'm attending this year and I'm super excited. Okay, so I'm actually on the NLC planning committee and so we have an amazing event planned. Uh, definitely check out as the social media to see what we're working on as well as the uh, NLC website. So basically, the National Leadership Conference, which Brian will probably share with us in a little bit, is a three-day event and it is geared towards dental students and pre-dental students and so there's different tracks that you can participate in throughout those three days one of those tracks being pre-dental and so with that pre-dental track we'll be diving deep into all things pre-dental we'll be talking about maybe the ethical dilemmas you'll face as the dentist so that when you go into interview you, you can talk about those ethical dilemmas we'll be talking about interviewing there'll be two networking breakfasts where you can meet uh, dental students from every single dental school within the state or within the nation so you can go around and mingle with different dental students to decide where you want to uh, potentially apply. Uh, so I would say it's definitely worth the money. I know it's an investment but uh, you need to look at it as really something that I think will complete an application. I think it shows uh, invested interest in the career field. Uh, know that it's not going to be something everybody has on their application and so it's definitely something that will make you stand out I feel like. What type of electives do dental schools look for? Um, so I, I mean electives you're going to want upper level science courses. Uh, we mentioned the ceramics, we mentioned maybe business courses. This is going to vary by school to school. Um, I would say science courses you can't really go wrong with. Uh, and then courses that pertain to dentistry. So think about the different facets of dentistry. Dentistry involves uh, maybe dealing with special needs people. So maybe you want to get a minor in uh, special needs communities if your university offers that. I know um, some pre students, because they're really interested in art, they minor in like art history. So that's also another option that you could consider. So it doesn't really have to be like anything directly related to dentistry, but I feel like anything that you're passionate about will weave into your identity like in dentistry. And I was actually talking to a pre-dental about this uh, last week because she's a dance minor and she's like, I asked her, I was like, how does dance relate to dentistry? And she's like, you know, I really don't know. And if you think about it, dance requires finesse. Dentistry definitely requires finesse. There's definitely uh, portions of dentistry where it requires you to be almost choreographed uh, per se, like maybe an extraction, a surgical extraction. So being able to just draw those connections between what you've done in dentistry. So how did we both obtain leadership positions? I'm currently the pre-dental consultant and Hillary's on the pre-dental advisory committee. 
um, there's an application that becomes available at the end of this year and you apply and then uh, those applications are voted on by our board of dental students who then select the leaders for the following year. I know personally for me I built a resume within ASDA by attending ASDA events. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a couple pre-dental chapter, a couple pre-dental organizations at my school so I got heavily involved with those and really just submitted the application. And for me, um, my freshman year, the in my district, there was an ASDA like pre-dental advisory committee that was um, created, and that was the first year that like it started. And I applied, not really expecting anything, but I got in, and that was where my involvement with ASDA began. And through that, I met like so many other um, ASDA members from like across the nation. So it has really skyrocketed from there. Okay, any other questions? I have some closing uh, slides I can uh, go over, Carson. Perfect. Okay. All right, here are their email address, here are the panelists' email addresses, but um, they will be up at the uh, end of the webinar, so I'm going to continue. Um, we'd like to thank our panelists for a great webinar, um, great program, great information, great questions. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, we, uh, to help us evaluate this program and the need for future programs, we'll be sending out a brief survey. We'd appreciate if you could take a few minutes to fill this out. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and all registrants will receive a link to access the recording by the end of the week. Uh, Pre-Dental Month continues throughout October. Join us for webinars on the DAT, paying for dental school, scholarships, interviewing, and non-traditional paths to dental school. If you haven't registered already, you can uh, do so at the URL about, or below, and that'll be on the last slide as well. We encourage you to join the American Student Dental Association as a pre-dental member. Pre-dental membership offers a wealth of benefits geared to help you to get into dental school. As a special incentive, join now and your membership will be extended through 2018. That's three additional months of membership for the cost of $68 a year. You can join online at the URL on the screen there. And we do have, we do have some spaces left for ASDA's National Leadership Conference, November 17th to the 19th in Chicago. Um, ASDA will have a three-day track exclusively for pre-dentals with topics including admissions, choosing a school, DAT preparation, interviewing, personal statement, and hands-on workshops. New this year, we will have two morning sessions where attendees can meet with students from every U.S. dental school. We'll hope you enjoy, we hope you will join us for this special event. Uh, please like us on Facebook um, at the URL, Facebook forward slash ASDA Pre-Dental. Uh, here you will find national and local event information, pre-dental tips, and resources. And lastly, I'd like you to participate in the ASDA's Pre-Dental Month Instagram contest. Tag at dental students and use the hashtag ASDA Pre-Dental Month. Thank you all for attending. And just as a reminder, um, the webinar is recorded and you will receive it by the end of next week. Um, thank you again, and here I'll leave this page up for you guys to copy, and if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Carson, Hillary, or myself. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carson, Hillary. Great webinar. Thank you. Thank you.